Put no more tears on the label. But it does make you cry. I know. <laughs> a trusted brand used in homes all across America for decades. Calc product uh, causes ovarian cancer. Bunsen's baby powder. Johnson & Johnson is likely the most recognizable household brand in the entire world. They've been around since 1886, and they dominate dozens of industries from pharmaceuticals and medical devices to consumer health and baby shampoo. They're currently the ninth largest company in the world, coming in at a monstrous market cap of $432 billion. But it's not just their market cap that's monstrous, because really, the entire company is monstrous. While their fluffy white baby powder and no-tear shampoo comes off as seemingly harmless, if you look at their history, you'll find that the company is anything but that. Like any corporate giant, J&J has been willing to pull whatever strings and go to whatever lengths to maximize their market share and profits. Whenever someone like Apple or Microsoft does this, while it's frowned upon, it, it's usually not that big of a deal. Worst case scenario, you end up with an iPhone that you can't repair or software that's filled with bloatware. But when a healthcare company like J&J does this, the consequences are much more deadly, literally. Over the years, J&J has been allegedly responsible for the death and suffering of millions of people. And to make things worse, these disastrous consequences were often not a result of an honest mistake or oversight. More times than not, they were a result of negligence and ignorance. This is why many argue that J&J has the bloodiest hands in the Fortune 500. But how did a family company evolve into being such a ruthless predator? Taking a look back, Johnson & Johnson did start off as a wholesome family business. As the name suggests, it was founded by the Johnson family. But there were actually three Johnsons in the business, not just two. This included the brothers Robert Wood Johnson I, James Wood Johnson, and Edward Mead Johnson. While J&J did start off as a family business, it never really went through that stage of being a bootstrapped garage startup. You see, Robert was already a pretty successful businessman, having founded a company called Seabury & Johnson which produced sterile surgery equipment. By 1878, this company alone was producing $10,000 per month in profits. That itself is a solid number, but when you account for inflation, it becomes $296,000 per month. So yeah, Robert was killing it. Unfortunately though, the founders would end up having a disagreement and Robert would eventually leave the business, but not before becoming extremely wealthy. Combine this with the fact that his brothers were also well off and talented in their own right, and starting up Johnson & Johnson was a breeze. The trio had capital, knowledge, experience, and connections from day one, so they hit the ground running. They hired 14 employees and launched a line of ready-to-use surgical supplies, and that marked the beginning of J&J in 1886. Over the next few years, the brothers aggressively grew their product line and made history within the surgical industry. They produced the world's first sterile surgical products, including sterile sutures, cotton, and gauze. And in 1894, they launched their signature baby powder. By this point, J&J had only been in business for a mere 8 years, but they were already employing 400 people and running 14 buildings. Not to mention, they were also becoming a household name. But just because they were successful and rich did not mean that they were evil or unethical. In fact, there is very little evidence suggesting that any of the brothers had ill intentions or immoral motivations. There's actually a bunch of evidence suggesting the exact opposite. During the Spanish-American War, for example, J&J donated 300,000 surgical dressings and created trauma stretchers for the soldiers. They also made substantial donations to the relief efforts of the 1990 Galveston hurricane and the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. And these weren't just for publicity either and you could tell based on how they treated their employees. For example, when the 1901 smallpox epidemic hit, J&J would sponsor the vaccination of all their employees. Similarly, during the Great Depression, J&J did not even lay off a single employee. They actually raised wages by 5%. J&J was also ahead of their time when it came to incorporating women into the workforce. Eight out of their first 14 employees were women. And over the next few decades, 
women accounted for roughly half of the company's workforce and led a quarter of their departments. But then, how did such an innovative, forward-thinking, and a generous company devolve into what they are today? Well, it all started with the brothers dying off one by one. Robert was the first one to go in 1910, dying of chronic kidney disease. 22 years later, James would die while returning from a vacation on the RMS Majestic. And finally, in 1934, Edward would pass away from a heart attack. Within just 10 years of the last founder dying, J&J would be taken public in 1944, and that marked the beginning of their moral freefall. Johnson & Johnson didn't just become immoral overnight though. After all, the company was led by the brothers' children, who carried many of the same values and principles as the brothers themselves. In fact, when the company was taken public, Robert's son, Robert Wood Johnson II, wrote an ethical guidelines book called Our Credo. This document outlined how choices had been made at the company for the past 60 years and how they should continue being made moving forward. Essentially, the credo advises leaders at the company to put the needs and well-being of the people they serve over profits. And it looks like this is what they were doing at the beginning. A perfect example of this was the Chicago Talon deaths. In 1982, seven individuals in the Chicago metropolitan area would all die shortly after taking extra-strength Tylenol. It turns out that someone had taken the Tylenol off store shelves, laced them with cyanide, and then put them back. After hearing about this, J&J didn't even hesitate to recall all 31 million bottles of Tylenol on store shelves and replace them with new Tylenol that came in tamper-proof packaging. This immediate action was praised around the world as being the gold standard for corporate crisis management. But with time, it seems that J&J has drifted further and further away from this gold standard, starting off with small infractions here and there. A perfect example of this is the illegal marketing of Risperdal. If you're not familiar with Risperdal, it's an antipsychotic that's used to treat schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and irritability caused by autism. Risperdal has been instrumental for many people over the years. But like any medication, it comes with side effects, and it's not applicable to everyone. One group of people that should not take Risperdal is older adults with dementia-related psychosis. And this was crystal clear since the medication was approved by the FDA in 1994. Nonetheless, J&J paid Omnicare, who is the largest pharmaceutical supplier for nursing homes, to promote Risperdal. And it wasn't until a whistleblower outed J&J in 2010 that they got caught. And the penalty for this despicable behavior was a mere $2.2 billion. For perspective, J&J profits $20 billion per year, which means that this penalty cost them a little more than a month of their current profits. This is just the tip of the iceberg though. J&J has also been linked with foreign bribery. Apparently, their sales reps paid doctors in Greece, Poland, and Romania to sell medication and medical devices. They also bribed officials in Iraq to win contracts. And the fine for all this? A measly 78 million. Aside from this, J&J has also gotten a lot more aggressive when it comes to protecting their patents. When we're talking about patents related to medical devices and medications, that's at least understandable. They usually have to invest hundreds of millions, if not billions, to create these products. So it makes sense that they don't want to get ripped off right after launch. Something that doesn't make sense though is the fact that J&J has previously tried to prevent the American Red Cross from using the Red Cross. If you didn't know, J&J actually owns the trademark for the Red Cross symbol. And in 2007, they sued the American Red Cross to stop using the emblem. Yeah, I don't think anything more has to be said about that. While these petty lawsuits, corruption, and marketing are inexcusable in themselves, it turned out that J&J actually had much darker secrets behind the curtains. One of the biggest lawsuits that has plagued J&J recently is the baby powder lawsuit. It is alleged that the talc-based powder that is iconic to their baby powder is actually contaminated with asbestos. The obvious reasoning for this is that the mines in which talc is mined are often lined with asbestos. So it's only natural that the talc is also contaminated with asbestos. But it was assumed that J&J had procedures and protocols in place to ensure that asbestos wouldn't show up in the final product. 
J and J, of course, insist that they do indeed have such procedures in place and they deny all allegations. But this didn't stop 40,000 cancer patients whose cancer may have been caused by asbestos from banding together and filing lawsuits against J and J. And the evidence that surfaced since then is disturbing to say the least. Allegedly, J and J found asbestos in their talc multiple times as early as 1972 but they didn't even notify the FDA. Instead of making change, J&J has opted to use legal loopholes to avoid liability, which came to light just earlier this year through Reuters. Apparently, J&J created a highly confidential plan called Project Plato. The plan entailed creating a new subsidiary and then shifting all the lawsuits to this new subsidiary. From there, the subsidiary would declare bankruptcy, which would push the cases to bankruptcy court and substantially reduce payouts. There are even allegations that J&J tried to get a federal judge to block Reuters from publishing their findings. I don't know about you, but that's highly sus to say the least. And that's not the only scandal that J&J has been caught up in either. J&J has also been embroiled in opioid lawsuits for the past several years as well. If you're not familiar with opioids, it's a substance that acts on opioid receptors to produce morphine-like effects. It's usually used in pain relief medications and anesthesia, and it can be instrumental when used properly. But if it ends up in the wrong hands, it can quickly lead to drug addictions and deaths due to overdose. You would think that pharmaceutical companies would be extremely careful when it came to distributing opioids, but they were actually doing the exact opposite. Between 2006 and 2015, Opioid companies spent $880 million on lobbying efforts to keep opioids easily accessible. Fortunately, all of this did eventually come to light, and pharmaceutical companies including J&J agreed to a settlement of $26 billion at the beginning of this year. But this doesn't really mean anything because the damage has already been done. Since 1999, 760,000 people have died due to drug overdose and two-thirds of these deaths in 2018 involved opioids. Personally, I don't think J&J can ever wipe their hands clean after this one. Nowadays, it's become extremely popular to hate on the biggest tech companies in the world, whether that be Apple, Google, or Facebook. But what I think we really need to focus on is these background companies that no one ever talks about or questions. Such companies aren't just collecting our data or selling us overpriced products. They're literally ruining lives, and that's not my opinion, that's a fact. Not all the lawsuits we discussed in this video are complete, but many of them are. And you can go online and read more about just how ignorant and complacent all these pharmaceutical companies have been, and just how little consequences they face for their actions. After hearing all this, I know a lot of you guys will want these companies to be shut down, but realistically, that's just not possible. While many of these companies engage in terrible behavior, they're also critical to the medical industry, so it's not possible to ditch all of them at the same time. What may be possible though is to hold them more accountable by spreading the word, and that might just get them to think twice before engaging in such behavior in the future. But that's just what I think. Did you realize just how monstrous these pharmaceutical companies are? Comment that down below. Also, drop a like if you hope that these companies feel the pain for once. And of course, consider checking out our Discord community to suggest future video ideas and consider subscribing to see more questions logically answered. But until then, I'm Hari, and I'll see you guys on the next one.